God loves life. God loves life. He breathes life into each one of us. He shapes and forms us before we're aware of his presence. God cares so deeply about life. There's a certain irony that this day that we talk about this we're going to be looking at the tenth of the our ten, ten week series on Ten Commandments, looking at that that you shall not murder, don't don't take life. On this day when in three different parts of our country, people burst out in anger and bitterness out of whatever that wherever that rage came from, and took life. And we don't look at that, and we would all just eat, you know easily nod our head and say that's wrong. But, but as we've been learning with all the Ten Commandments, to walk in the freedom of God and the life of God is to understand with greater complexity what God's talking about, what he's getting at. This God who delights in life is the one who said this simple command. The whole commandment that we're going to look at today is just two words. So in, in English, it would be no murder. Now, there's a word in the Hebrew for kill. That's a different word. Murder is something very specific. And we're going to be clear about what that isn't and what that is today. But in the Ten Commandments, God says with these two words, he says, no murder. We translate it this way, you shall not murder. And, and, and I think most of us have a sense of, of, we think we know what that means, but we're going to dig into the scriptures, we're going to look at what God is saying, and, and what we want to get to is we want to get to the condition of the heart, not just other people's hearts, the condition of our hearts, because God's about life. And if we're followers of Jesus, whether you're in the worship center, family worship venue, or online, we have 100 or 200 people that will follow this service online today, and we have three services today, where, you know, whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're a follower of Jesus, God says, I'm about life, you should be about life. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we're so glad you're here, and we invite you to continue to listen and learn. Shoreline's a great place to kind of discover who God is and who Jesus is. But when we think about this, this idea of life and the value of each life, I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine, I'm going to show you four pieces of art up on the center screen here. And, and you probably, as you look at those, you can probably identify, you got a Van Gogh, you got a Da Vinci, you got a Michelangelo, and you got a, just checking, seeing if you're with me. Yeah, you got a Monet. Uh, and I want you to imagine, and, I, and I've, been, I've been at great museums in Europe and, and here in different parts of our country, and, and, and I've seen some of these great masterpieces. And they're always on a beautiful wall, and then there's like a, like a kind of a cord, like a, you know, a red velvet cord kind of saying, you know, don't go any closer than this. But I want you to imagine that somebody came to one of these great pieces of art, and they just jumped over the barrier, took a razor blade, and just started slashing the piece of art. Just slashed it to shreds. I mean, that would hit the front pages of the news. Masterpiece destroyed. What we don't recognize is that, that when God in his word, God tells us this in Genesis 1, God says, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. You shall not murder, is talking about human beings. Don't take life, don't take a human life. Why? Because when God made you, he said, you were made in my image. You are an image bearer of God Almighty. Even if you don't believe that, even if you don't understand it, you are made in the image of the living God. Every man, every woman made in the image of God. The theologians call it the Imago Dei. You bear the image of God Almighty. It's not that we look physically like God, but we bear the ability to do good, to love, to care, to, to create. God, God has made us in his image. So when you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, you can look and say, there's a masterpiece. Maybe not first thing when you look in the mirror. <laughs> You're like, give me, give me five minutes to adjust a few things. But you go, you, that's a masterpiece. It's true. And if that's true of you, it's true of the person sitting next to you. 
If you know the person next to you, nudge them and just say, you're a masterpiece. If you don't know them, just kind of just take a minute of silence, right? I mean, th- th- this, this is what the word of God says. And, 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 to, and this, is why, this is why God cares. This is why God said, you shall not murder. As a matter of fact, what, what I think what God is getting at and what we're going to understand through this commandment, as of all the commandments, it's about freedom, it's about life. And so if you understand this commandment, you understand this. That we are called to be life givers, life protectors, and not life takers. We're called, if you're a follower of Jesus, you you are a life giver, you are a life protector, you are not a life taker. And that should be in every moment of every day. We should bring life wherever we go. When you show up in a group of people, life should enter that place. Joy. And people, you should leave and people should say, man, I'm so glad she was here. She brings so much life. I'm so glad he was here. He brings life. That's what Christians should do because we are filled with the image of God and we walk in his presence. We have his assignment. Don't just protect life. Bring life. Give life all day long in all that you do. That's God's desire for us. In one of the books that I used as I researched for this uh, sermon, and there'll be the last few copies we have will be in the bookstore next week. Uh, Mark Mitchell, one of the, the guy who wrote the book um, Ten: How the Commandments Set Us Free, he asked this question. It's a great question. Just ponder this question for a minute. Do my attitude and actions reflect the truth that life is sacred and precious to God, and thus must be protected, encouraged, and enhanced? Not just protected, but encouraged and enhanced. In other words, am I a life giver? Ask yourself that question. Do I bring life? Do I I, I not just stand for life or protect life? Do I bring life into every interaction, into every encounter? And if we were to do that, what a difference it would make. In Proverbs chapter 6, there's one of these couplings where it talks about there's six of these or seven of these. And so, so, so God kind of lists these seven things he doesn't like. I'm just going to give you half of them. Let's read verses, uh, 17, uh, verses 16 and 17 of Proverbs 6. It says this. There are, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. God just doesn't like these. Here's the first three. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. God God. God cares about life and hands that shed innocent blood. That is of deep concern to the God who made you in his image and who loves you, but who made every person you'll ever encounter in his image, and he loves them as well. Now, oftentimes when you're talking about what something is, when you're talking about what something means, it's helpful to say what you're not talking about. So when we look at, when we look at this commandment, you shall not murder, I want to be clear what we're not talking about, all right? Because there's a word in the Bible you, that's for to kill, that's different than to murder. Murder has a very specific meaning. That's what we're looking at today. But, but here's some things that this commandment's not talking about. Okay, it's not talking about self-defense. It's not saying you should never defend yourself. It's not talking about war that protects freedom or lives. It's not talking about that. It's not talking about eating meat. Somebody says, oh, look, at it. it says right there, don't murder. It's not talking about eating meat. It's not even talking about capital punishment. Those are dealt with in the Bible in different places. And, and if you want to build a case for any of these, this isn't the passage to use. You might find other passages. You might want to build a case for those things. That's fine. Just don't go to this passage because this passage is about something very specific. It's about murder. It means something very specific. If you're a note taker, you'll see in your notes in the bulletin, there's a place to write some notes on or if you have your Shoreline app open, there's a place to kind of fill in some notes there in your Shoreline app for the notes for today. The heartbeat of this commandment. What is the heartbeat of this about? And it's a number of different things. Here's the first thing. The heartbeat about this commandment is about premeditated murder. It's about what happened in El Paso yesterday. It's about about what happened in Ohio late last night, early this morning. It's about what happened at the Gilroy Garlic Festival this last week, where somebody makes a decision to do something so vile, so violent, out of whatever whatever drives them, whatever's going on, it's hard to even comprehend. But, But God is saying, don't do that. Don't take life. And as a pastor, I need to say, you know, I can stand here and say, now, of course, nobody here would ever do anything like that. But I, I, don't, I think I have to pause and say, you know what? Check your heart. Say, you know what? Are there moments I am so angry at some people or so outraged at things? 
And I feel my heart rate go up and I feel my hands start to, kind of my fists start to clench and go, man, I could just, man, what I could do. And, and if you get to those places, if you get to those moments, if you find that welling up in you, man, talk with a pastor, talk with a Christian counselor. If you have, even if you have a medical doctor you go to and, and your regular checkup, just say, listen, I got, I mean, I'm just being, this rage is taken over. Talk with somebody. And if you find that welling up inside of you, talk with a family member who you love and who you trust. It, it, it might be an emotional thing. It might be a chemical imbalance. It might be just that people have treated you really badly and there's a lot of rage, but there's, but man, be so careful because, because when we lash out in our anger, it breaks the heart of God. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you can walk in his power and walk in his strength. Even if there's things you're upset about, say, God, help me. God, give me strength, but get the help you need. But the heartbeat of this commandment is about premeditated murder. That's one of the things that we need to look at and be aware of and say, that breaks the heart of God. But it's more than that. Another thing it's about, the heartbeat of this commandment is about protecting life in the womb. It's, a, it's about protecting the most vulnerable and most innocent of all life. Life that even hasn't had a chance yet to breathe the air of this world, but is still shaped and formed by the hands of God. And I was thinking about this, I was grappling with this, because we live in a world where there's lots of perspectives and lots of arguments and lots of debates. But, I, but I, will, I will say something. As I was studying this, I did some reading. And this has been, this studying for this sermon, there have been lots of heavy stuff and a lot of things that were really uh, kind of weighed on my heart as I was preparing. But, but this one really struck me. That I, I read an article that's actually, you can find it at smithsonian.com. And, and this, I'll give you the, the short version of this article, but it was fascinating to me. That in 1996, th there were uh, some geologists who were snowmobiling in Antarctica and they found a rock. And they went through this whole process of positing that this rock was actually a piece of Mars. And that, 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 that there was a meteorite that hit Mars, blew some stuff up. This floated around the atmosphere for a really long time and fell to Earth in Antarctica. And they found this. And, so, and then as they took it, they began to study it. And, and they began, and I, I get the exact wording here. And they, when they kind of dissected this rock and looked at it really closely, here's what they came to, this conclusion. They said... They found chains of globules, chains of globules that bore a striking resemblance to some bacteria form on earth. So they, they found within the rock chains of globules that, that resembled some forms of bacteria on earth. And what they declared was this. We have found, anybody remember? What we have found life on Mars. They declared they had found life in a rock that they had, that they, I mean, they had this whole theory, and I mean, and you can read the article. Tons of scientists came together. They were celebrating. We found proof of life. And it was chains of globules that bore a striking resemblance to chains that some bacteria form on Earth. I want you to imagine something. Imagine that they found that rock. They thought it came from Mars. And when they looked at it, what they found was the combination of a human sperm and a human egg that had joined and for two months it had been growing, and there was just a teeny little baby. What would they have called that? I mean, they called chains of globules that bore a striking resemblance to some bacteria on Earth life. I think that they, if they looked and saw, this is a human, they, grow, you know, they would go, that's life. I hope that what we can do is slow down in our world and with all the sound bites and all the things we're hearing, stop and say, what does God have to say about life? If I'm, if I'm a follower of Jesus, what is, what is life according to God? Listen to these words from Psalm 139. Just let God speak to your heart. Psalm 139, David is talking about himself. Or he's talking about himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Here's what David writes. He says, oh God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. This is David, inspired by the Holy Spirit. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I love this. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He goes, I'm wonderful. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Translated, your works are wonderful. I'm totally awesome. Sorry, Dennis. Dennis doesn't like to use the word awesome around here, but, but, you know, but, you know, but, but you know, I, your works are wonderful. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. This picture of his mother's womb. I love this, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Can I tell you something? God knew you in your mother's womb. Before your parents named you, God knew your name. 
And God not only had a plan for your life, he still does. You're that precious to him. And so is every other person around you. And then if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, you can go to Luke chapter one. In Luke chapter one, there's this amazing encounter. I call it the first time that Jesus and John the Baptist met. Because what happens is Mary, the mother of Jesus, is pregnant with Jesus, and, John, and then Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. And Mary and Elizabeth, who are cousins, meet each other. And I want you to watch what happens in this passage. And if you have your own Bible, you can highlight or underline the key things here. But watch what happens starting in verse 39 of Luke 1. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried into the, a town in the hill country of Judea, where she, when she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb. That's John the Baptist. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, she tells Mary, and blessed is the child you will bear, the, the child that you have right now. Right? Blessed is Jesus, the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord, she says, Mary, you're the mother of my Lord, and Mary's carrying Jesus, should come to me. As soon as your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. I love that. John the Baptist and Jesus are still in their mother's wombs. And their mothers meet, and, and something happens. Something happens. Christians are life protectors, life lovers, life enhancers, and encouragers. We don't just want to protect life. We want to help life all the way through. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The heartbeat of this commandment is about more than just that. The heartbeat of this commandment is also about taking life, euthanasia, assisted to suicide, suicide. In, in just two years ago, in, in, in uh, 2017, um, in 2017, they, um, there were over 45,000 people in the United States who took their own lives. And a whole lot more than that tried. And, and I, I believe that God's love for us is such that he would say, protect life, even your own life. Even your own life. If you're, if you're a person who just, if you, if you feel discouraged and down, if there's moments where you say, I don't think this life is worth it, then cling to Jesus and, and get help. Talk with a pastor, talk with your doctor, talk with a Christian, talk with a counselor and say, man, I'm feeling like my life's not worth it. I mean, talk with somebody about that. Talk with one of your family members or your friends, somebody who will love you enough to walk with you. And it, you, it may be a chemical issue, it may be just you've had hard things in life, whatever it is, but God says, your life, I mean, just know this, your life is precious to God. More, even if it's not precious to you right now, it's precious to God. And, and to take our own lives, I think is going against what God says in this commandment. It's willfully taking our own life or to take the life of somebody else or to have somebody else take our life. And it's gotten very, it's gotten very complicated in our world now because now there are places in the world where they, can, they actually will allow you to take your own life. Where physicians, doctors who are, who are really supposed to be protecting and lift, lifting up life are taking life. And I read this piece, this is, in, this is in the book, The Ten Commandments that Kevin DeYoung wrote. And again, we have those in our, in our bookstore. But this was fascinating to me because it's talking about what's happened in the Netherlands, which was the first place to adopt phys physician-assisted suicide. But I want you to hear something. Listen, listen, this is a little portion of this book. It says, assisted suicide laws have consequences most people don't think about on the front end. The Netherlands was the first nation to allow legal assisted suicide. And over time, they've seen the voluntary become involuntary. When it becomes an option for you to end your life, insurance companies begin to say, well, we aren't going to pay for this treatment or extend your life another six months or a year, but we can give you these two pills and you can end your own life. And that's happening. You can become a burden to your insurance provider, to the state, to your own family. And this, blew, this, blew, this just I didn't blow my mind. This broke my heart. In the Netherlands, more and more requests for assisted suicide in the Netherlands are coming from family members and not from the patients themselves. Kids are coming to the doctor saying, I think mom's lived long enough. I think it's time to let dad take... This, this, is, this is happening in our world. And this insight, was, this insight just staggered me. It says, during the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands... 
Dutch physicians refused to obey orders by Nazi troops to let the elderly and the terminally ill die. In the Netherlands, just a short time ago, at the risk of their own life, they said, we will not let the elderly and the ill die. All right? In 2001, Holland became the first country to give legal status to doctor-assisted suicide. As Malcolm Muggridge noted, it took only one generation to transform a war crime into an act of compassion. Look at that change. The same doctors in the same country were saying, we will not let these people die, and now they say, we'll help take their lives. We have to check our hearts. We have to watch the tide of our world and the tide of our culture as it flows faster and faster, as Christians to step back and say, God, what do you say about life? Not, not what does this, not, not what does this you know, bumper sticker say or this billboard say, God, what do you say about life? God, what do you say about me? And what do you say about the person sitting next to me? And we've got to hear from God because God is the giver and the maker of life. And the masterpiece that God has made, this room's filled with them. So it's the family worship venue. You know, th- th- we're precious to God. We've got to be very careful. What is this commandment talking about? It's talking about more than just physical murder. Here's the question. Is refraining from physical murder enough? And Jesus said, no. He said, there's more going on here. And with each of the Ten Commandments, when Jesus addressed them, he takes us to a deeper place. So listen to these words found in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. Jesus is teaching, and he says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, and he quotes from Exodus 20, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to his brother or sister, raka, which means empty-headed one, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come offer your gift. Jesus says it's so important that we love people well, that we build reconciliation. That if you're coming to worship and you realize you've got a problem with someone, get up, head out, get that right first. Wow. Wow. God cares about restored relationships. And Jesus says, you know, you don't just murder with your hands. He says, you can murder with your words. You can murder with your eyes. I mean, you talk about, oh, she's staring like she has daggers. He's staring like he has daggers. Yeah, we can do that. The old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. For most of you, you've been, if I say, what have you been hurt by more in life? Sticks and stones hitting you or the words that people have spoken that cut into your heart like a razor? And words, you say, Jesus is saying, it's more than just the physical act of murder. It's treating people in a murderous way. It's speaking of people or to people in a murderous way. And Jesus says, it's a bigger deal than we realize. Jesus is the giver, lover, and sustainer of life, and he calls us to share in his ministry. He says to you and me, it's not enough that we just go, I didn't kill anybody today. But But how did I speak to people? How did I treat people? Did I bring life where I could bring life? Or did I bring death and pain and heartache and sorrow and brokenness? Jesus takes us to a next step. Yes, the physical act is wrong, but also there's more to it than that. So how how do we then become those who share in his ministry by bringing life? How do we do this? Here's some things to just take with you and think about. Watch your heart. Just watch your heart. When your heart is saying, I hate her. Man, I wish he was dead. Well, my heart would never say that. Don't give yourself too much credit. Be a little careful. Before you, you know, when, you, when your heart says, oh, those people like that. <laughs> I, don't, you know, I don't like those kind of people. Man, watch your heart. Watch your heart. All, all through history, during wars when people, when, when, or, or, or when countries themselves were consuming their own people and taking their own people into, you know, and, and, and when these things happen, something happens in the heart that says they're not human, they're not people, and there's this hatred that grows, and then almost anything can happen. And where's, where's my heart? I gotta watch my heart. Watch your mind. Watch what you put in your mind. Now, I'm gonna upset some of you, and I'm gonna bother some people, but just hang in there with me for a minute, Okay. Watch what you put in your mind. If you sit and watch hours and hours and hours of shows that are about murder and death and dismemberment and you become so numb to it, 
but my favorite six shows are all about people getting killed and how people solve how they got killed. And it's just, and I love, you know, I, I'm just saying, just ask yourself if I'm filling my brain with that all the time. If you sit for a half an hour, hour, two hours every night playing a video game where you are mowing down and gunning down, they're not real people. They're just little, they're just people on, you know, that look more and more real as time goes on and more and more realistic. But I mean, I'm just, you know, and, 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 you, and you say, does that affect me? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what affects I don't know the human heart. I don't know the human mind. I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a pastor. But I, I, I just have to believe that the things that we take into our eyes and fill our minds with over time, in some way, I think it starts to shape how we see things. I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying, we, what, watch what you put. Watch what you put in your mind, your eyes, your heart. Watch your mouth. Watch what you say. And we can say things, our words can cut like a razor. And sometimes we mean for them to. <laughs> Got her back. Go, oh, well, wait a minute. We are life givers. We are life protectors. We are to love people like Jesus does. And God will make all things right someday. But, but our, our call is as best we can to love people with the love of Jesus. Watch your mouth and what you say. Watch your hands. When you feel your fists start to kind of clench, <laughs> and when you feel like, oh man, I'm just, yeah, I could just, be careful what you could just do. Be careful. Yeah, I'm gonna have a couple of stories run through my mind. I've been a pastor for over 30 years. I've seen a lot of things. Some of the most, some of those kindest, most gentle people, at the, if you push them too far, man, the things we can do. Lord, help us. Just keep praying. Lord, help me. Watch my mind. Watch my mouth. Watch my heart. Watch my hands. And as Christians, we should be life givers. As Christians, we should be engaged in giving life. You can't just say, I'm a Christian, so I'm, a, I'm against taking life. That's fine. But before life, you know, before giving life, and not just at the beginning, all life. So, so we have a lot of people at Shoreline who have kids they support in El Salvador and in Honduras, other parts of the world, through Compassion International. Man, who write a check every month, month after month after month after month to, to give food and clothing and some, and some Christian education and some help to children. And we know these kids by name and we pray for them by name. And if you support those kids, that's great. Can I give you another encouragement? Write them a letter. You can do it online. You can do it by hand. When they send you that stuff and say, write a letter, I've been there, I've visited these kids. The money makes a difference. The letters you write make almost, you give life when you say, stay in school. Keep growing to love Jesus. Here's a picture of my family. And walk with those kids. Pour into them. We, we, we love life, so we pour into life. All right? You're part of a local church. I mean, get involved in what we're doing in our community. Come help with the clothing closet, the food pantry. Visit shut-ins in a retirement home. We have our Hope Christmas party coming up where we're gonna have people here from all of our community and you can bless them and bring life. That's what we do. We're Christians. Be part of that. Uh, support local hospitals that seek to bring physical life and institutions of learning where, 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 where Christ is present, where if, they're, if they're not against Christ, but if there's institutions of learning, pour into those. They help, you know, help children. Go, go read to kids in a classroom. Um, you know, pour, pour in it. Go visit a care center. You go to care centers around here and say, is there anybody who never gets a visit? They'll have people on their list. And just pop in once a, once a month and more often if you can. Just spend a half an hour and talk with them and pray. They give life, bring life, bring life. Christians stand against human trafficking. We support orphanages. We, you know, we, 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 we care for the hungry. This is what we do. This is what we should all be doing if we follow Jesus. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, boy, when you come to know him, you understand his grace, you want to do that kind of stuff. But get involved in bringing life, sustaining life, enhancing life. That's what we're called to do. And in John 10, 10, Jesus says these words. He's just talking about the enemy, about Satan, and he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Look what Jesus says. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's the heart of Jesus. And if the heart of Jesus is beating in your heart, then you want to bring fullness of life to other people. How can I bless this person? How can I bless this family? How can I invest my time, my energy, my resources to bring life and hope in a world that's so broken and so hurting? How do we come alongside people who are in a time where they're hurting and lonely and struggling? That's what we do. And I love that the Apostle Paul, who wrote the most books of the New Testament of anybody, I love that he understood the grace of Jesus so powerfully because you know what the Apostle Paul was doing before he became the Apostle Paul? 
He was killing Christians. He mourned the fact that he had the blood of Christians who were his brothers and sisters, who, people who had died because of his persecution of the church. He was killing Christians and he became one of the greatest leaders in the church. If you look at yourself and you say, oh man, I've done stuff. I've done things. I've, I've broken some of the commandments. I've broken this commandment in, 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 a, in, a, in some way, in many ways. God says, my grace is enough. The apostle Paul says, I'm the worst of all sinners. He says, man, what I've done, he says, but if God could forgive me, he can forgive anybody. So whatever you carry in your heart, his grace is enough. And if you come to the cross and you receive the life of Jesus, then you begin to pour it out and pour it out. Jesus, that's our prayer. Pour out of us your life. You have filled us with so much life, we can't even contain it. We've come to the cross. If we've received your grace, we've received your forgiveness, you live in us by your Holy Spirit. So Jesus, pour through us and pour out of us and use us to bring your love and your light and your grace to this world. Let us partner with you in your life-giving, life-sustaining, life-enhancing work every day of our lives. Oh, Lord, that's a mission. That's a calling. And you've called each one of us who've come to the cross to bear your life in this world that oftentimes doesn't. So fill us with your power to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. We live in a dark, broken world. We've been reminded about it this week, in the last 24 hours. Bear the light and the life of Jesus. Receive his life. Remember that you are a child made in the image of the living God. You are beloved by God. You are precious in his sight. You are valuable more than you comprehend. And so is every other person you meet. Amen? Amen. Share that love. Share that light. God bless you. Have a great week.